Good morning. We have with us today Brad Broom, retired professor from Ferris State University who taught welding classes. He'll be showing Nelson Ogden the essentials of welding skills this rainy day, September 4th, 2021. Brad, take it from here. Okay, let's start out with the cylinders. First of all, we have the oxygen cylinder. It comes with 2,200 pounds of pressure, 22 to 2,400 pounds of pressure. We have the acetylene cylinder. That comes with 250 pounds, and I'll explain the contents of that. Anytime you are with oxygen and acetylene equipment, if there's a notch on any of the equipment, that means it's left-handed. Anything with a notch is left-handed. If it doesn't have a notch, it's right-handed. Okay, let's start with the oxygen cylinder. This is a right-handed thread that goes on to here. It has a ball-type seat, so when you seat it, when you operate this cylinder, you open it completely or shut it completely. Okay, and it also has a safety in case it's in the hot sun or something and builds up more pressure, it'll automatically blow off. The same thing with the acetylene. Now the acetylene cylinder, one thing to remember about acetylene, you never want it to operate over 15 pounds per square inch or it becomes unstable. It could blow up at any time. So in that acetylene cylinder is acetone. And acetone stabilizes that acetylene because it's at 250 pounds. It's sort of a porous material in there and it absorbs the acetylene. So as you're drawing the acetylene out, it's sort of like you open a can of Coke and the fizz of the pop coming out. The same thing with acetone, I mean acetylene coming out of the acetone. You can never draw out more than one seventh of the contents of that cylinder at any time or you will siphon out the acetone. This cylinder always has to be used in the upright position because if you set it on its side, the acetone will wreck your gauges. It's going to run into your gauges. Okay. Settling equipment, left-handed thread. Okay. Now in this particular cylinder, it has the T-handle. When you open that, quarter to half a turn is all for safety reasons. Okay, now you have flashback arresters over here. Them can either go on the gauges or on the torches. The reason I like to put them on the gauges more than the torches, because let's say I cut this piece of steel here, and it's red hot, and your hose is right here, and it falls on the hose and burns the hose in half, mm -hmm. now the flame can't go back into here. Uh -huh. But if it's on the torch, it's not, you know, see what I'm saying? Right. So that's why I would put the flashback arresters right here on your gauges. Sure. Okay? Makes sense. Okay. You got these hooked up. And I'm going to screw something on here just to show you how you can check the pressures on your gauges. Let's tighten them up first. But I would... In the manual, it says you can put them on either one, but I prefer them being on the gauges. Okay. You can do that later. Okay. This is left angular head. There you go. have your gauges hooked up, that's right, that's all I need right here, you want to check for leaks. Now the best way to do it, of course, is soapy water. Okay. But one of the fastest ways to do it is, how I do it, is I'm going to turn this cylinder on, okay, and when you are, the pressures I like to run, I tell everybody, if you're gas welding, five pounds of acetylene, five pounds of oxygen. If you're cutting, 5 pounds of acetylene, 30 pounds of oxygen. That's pretty standard. This gauge here tells you how much gas is in your cylinder. This, gas, this gauge here 
tells you the operating and the pressure you are working at. So which gauge is going to go down first? The cylinder pressure as you're using the cylinder, mm -hmm. right, until it gets, let's say, down below 30 here, then this gauge will drop. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn this cylinder on. Now when you turn the cylinders on, sort of turn it on easy in the beginning so you don't give that sudden mm -hmm. jerk to that regulator. Okay. Okay? You can see we're at 1,200 pounds. I'm going to open this cylinder all the way. Okay, now we want working pressure, so I'm going to open my oxygen valve a little bit. And I'm going to turn this in until I get around 30 pounds. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it off. See it creep up a little bit? See that? Uh -huh. That's why we open the valve mm. so we get a true 30 pounds. Okay. Now the easiest way to check this and see if it has a leak mm -hmm. is I'm going to back this out a little bit and turn this cylinder off. Okay? Mm -hmm and you watch the gauge. If this gauge drops first, the leak is between here, you got a wrench, I'll show you. Yeah. You know the leak is between the cylinder and the gauge. Nothing bigger. <laughs> watch as I crack this, you'll see the, that's why I loosen this up a little bit, so you'll see this gauge will drop first a little bit. See it? Uh -huh. Before the other one. Sure. That's how I know that the leak was here. Mm -hmm. If the other gauge drops first, then you know the leak is in the hose on this side. Okay. And that's the same for acetylene. But that's the quick way to check your cylinders when you hook them up. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn this cylinder on. You see how much pressure is in your tank. And we are, oh, about 80 pounds. Okay. Also on a set of clean cylinder, because of that acetone in there, if it's, a, if it's out here and it's like 20 degrees out, you might not get any pressure, but if you bring your cylinder in and warm it up again, it'll release that, the acetylene from the acetone. So if you bring it inside and warm it up, you'll still get a little bit of gas out of it. So that's remember a lot of people in their garages. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open my settling up. Turn it on. And what pressure I'm going to run? Around five, correct? Correct. They creaked up a little bit. So on this acetylene cylinder, there's no reason you should run any more than five pounds. Okay. Okay. Now you got a striker there. I'm going to light a torch. Okay, when you, with the acetylene torch, there's different size orifices in here. Mm -hmm. That orifice only has a certain range. If you, if, it, if you need more heat, then you got to go to a bigger tip. If you need less heat, you got to go to a smaller tip. And that's why I said you want to get the bigger tips. Okay. Because it'll be a lot easier for you, mm -hmm. especially brazen and stuff. But there's three flames. When you light the torch, the first one's carburizing. That's more acetylene than oxygen. Then you want a neutral flame, which is 50-50. Then you can have an oxidizing flame, which is more oxygen than acetylene. So that's why I want to show you how to adjust it. Okay. Okay. Here to get some gas coming out of the lines. Boom. Okay. See the soot coming off? Uh-huh. Okay. You only got so much adjustment. See the soot's gone? Mm -hmm. Right about, you want to turn it up so the soot's just burning off, just like that. Okay. Then you turn your oxygen on. See if you get the long feather. When that comes to a point, that trick's a little dirty, but see the, see the perfect point? Okay. That's a neutral flame. Mm -hmm. And if you turn it up anymore, you'll hear it hiss. Mm. That's an oxidizing flame. Too much oxygen, not enough acetylene. Okay, but you can only turn, see I can turn it up a little bit more to get a little more BTUs out of it and that, but that's about it. 
Okay. Okay. You have a little block of wood here? Yeah. Sometimes the easiest way to clean the tip is you just put it on here like so and do that a couple times. Hmm. Instead of the tip cleaner, it'll pop off the dirt, but I don't know how dirty this will be. So I'm going to have to clean it. But you do that a couple times on a block of wood, hmm. that'll clean your tip. Because every time you stick, this is just copper, uh -huh. and you take a tip cleaner, it's like a drill, you screw it, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So you don't want to do it any more than you have to. So you we'll have to use a tip cleaner, but like I said, these are older than them. Okay. If you want, let's take this off and I'll show you on the cutting torch. Okay. We're going to take this off. Before we do that, though, we got to... You don't have to turn the tanks off. Okay. You can turn these out until there's no pressure. Oh, no, it'll fall right on the floor. Don't take it out too much. Okay, you can pull this off. Okay. It might be in this too. And here a little bit might be. Have a little issue. Actually, Brad, those issues are good for experience. Yeah. Sure. Yep, yep, that's a, that's a learning. Okay, now on this, we're going to put it right back. Remember, we're going to run still on the acetylene. We'll run five. See how much it creeps up and down there? Mm -hmm. Then on the oxygen, we're going to turn that on. We're going to run this one up to 30. 30. Okay, how a cutting torch works, you have preheat flames are coming up this tube here. Then you have what's called the oxygen, where it cuts, it'll be the oxygen blast. Okay. And actually, with steel, what it does is it burns the carbon in the steel. Hmm. So that's why you can cut mild steel and stuff, but you can't cut stainless steel, you can't cut cast iron and stuff like that. It has to have steel in it, you know, the carbon, for to do it. Okay. So we're going to light this basically the same way. See the soot? Uh -huh. see, see it lifts the tip? You want it to not leave the tip right away. Turn the oxygen on. And when we set the neutral flame for that, you're going to hit your oxygen lever. See, you hear that popping? Uh -huh. It's got a leak in the tip. But see how I just hit the oxygen a little? Then you bring it to a neutral tip, to a neutral flame. So when you adjust it, you always put the oxygen. Okay? That's all there is to it. And when you cut with the torch, what you want to do is you're going to bring it up to a preheat where it's red. And then we call that kindling temperature. Not a very good guy to give you one on the dollar line. But that's basically, see? Okay, sure. Basically what you do. Okay. Pretty simple, okay? Mm -hmm. We're going to do this again, so we'll back this out. We'll put our other torch back on. We'll turn this, back this on. We'll take this off. But when you get a new cutting attachment, see, do you hear that pop, pop, pop? Mm -hmm. That's this torch head is not seated in here, right? Hmm. Okay. You're gonna, like I said, you're gonna wanna, if you wanna do this, get the right equipment, and you don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff they wove it on the Mayflower with. Right? Yeah, 
a lot of times you'll go by and the people they rent torch sets and that and you'll see people out in the farmer's field with the torches laying on their side in the back of a pickup. Mm -hmm. You're going, well that ain't going to last long, the acetone will be in them gauges. Do the gas companies that fill these tanks have to do anything to make sure there's enough acetone in them? What they do is they don't fill them, they're going to exchange them. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's only a couple companies left that make acetylene, that's why it's so expensive. Hmm. Because the last big one down in Detroit just burnt down again. Huh. They used to use, years ago, that's what the miners used, was acetylene. It's calcium carbide water what makes acetylene. Mm -hmm. And you get like, that's what the calcium carbide lamps in the mines, that's what they used. They put, uh, it was a tablet. You put it in there, added water, and they give off acetylene gas. And that's where you had, for the miners, had their helmets. Mm. And in the old cars, the first cylinders, like the plumbers used, they had one that's called an MC, because they used to have acetylene headlights, mm -hmm. and the MC stood for motor car, and then they had a cylinder that was a B, and that stood for bus. It was a bigger cylinder for the bus headlights. Huh. Wow. So when they used acetylene, but yeah, it's made with calcium and carbide and water, mm -hmm. but them plants down there, yeah, the other one, they just burned up, and that's why acetylene's getting sort of expensive. Hmm. Not that many plants make it anymore. Huh. Okay, now we'll hook up to this mixer here for now. So that's got the built-in flash for the animal. Okay. And when you get, if you get a new handle, which I would do, go buy the Victor stuff. That's mm -hmm. top of the line and it's easy and at least expensive. Okay. And uh, that should be all built into them too. Okay. Come all three done. Okay, now go ahead and let's see, I just turn this one on. Go ahead and set that at five. You only got to turn it about a quarter of a turn okay. on there. There we go. Same with the oxygen. Set that around five. Yeah, yeah, turn it on, I'm sorry. Okay. You'll get the feel of it. Sure. Okay, now what I brought is some steel here. I'm going to move and make the spot on the bench here. And, uh, I brought some brazing rods. I'll show you how to braze. Pretty simple. Brazing is a non fusion process. It's sort of like soldering, you don't melt the material. Mm -hmm. Gas welding, you melt the material. Okay. And we're sort of limited here because you don't have very many tip size, so I'll show you how to braise today. Okay. And uh, gas welding, so all you're going to do is like, let's say you do an edge joint here, you're just going to melt the two pieces and it just folds right together. You can use filler or whatever. It's relatively. You probably not hardly going to ever do any gas welding. You would stick weld or something instead. Okay. But brazing, that's something you might do somewhere. You know, I do a lot of brazing. You want to oh, do a pipe joint to something or whatever, you know. And it's pretty simple. Arm and I'll show you the basics on brazing. I'll need to, there's a bunch of brazing rod here you can practice. Okay. But like I said, before I really got practicing and doing a bunch, I can show you the, I would go get a new setup. You know, the gauges and that are fine, but I would get a new mixer. This is called the mixer. Okay. And then the tips, and that Victor set will come like a zero. The, the lower the number, the smaller the tip. Mm -hmm. And remember, you can only use a certain amount. Um, they'll start out like three aught, which is small, which is three zeros, two aught, one, which is one zero, then it'll go one, two, three, four, etc. Okay. Then you can get a heating tip if you want to heat something and bend it. And then also on the mixer, your cutting attachment will just screw on. Mm -hmm. Even though it has a wrench, Fitting on here, mm -hmm. hand tight over. Okay. Don't use a wrench on mm -hmm. it. You don't need to. Mm -hmm. 
striker. Okay. I'm going to weld right on your bench here. Sure. But a lot of times you can get like fire brick or something and you can work off of them, but it doesn't matter. Okay. You want to put your, sort of look over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to want to clean it a little bit. I'm going to tack this end. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this tip will get hot enough. Always want the neutral flame if you can. The bottom plate is going to be, the edge is going to want to get hotter before the bottom plate. Mm. You can just That bench, see the reason you use a brick mm -hmm. is because that bench is sucking the heat out of the plate okay. right now. But there, you see, there's a tack. See how I tack that together? Uh -huh. Go ahead and put your mask on. Remember, this, this still gives up ultraviolet infrared rays just like an arc world. Okay. So it will, it will burn your eyes. Now I'm going to come down here. And then get it up to temperature. Like I said, you'll have some different size tips and you'll get the feel of it. Uh -huh. I just want to show you the basic. There's a flux, is the cleaning agent on here. And a lot of times if they're rusty or whatever, you want to sand them and clean them up before. Just like soldering or whatever. Okay. You know, but that just rod comes with a flux on it, just like so. See what I'm doing there? Uh -huh. If it starts to get too hot, you just get away from it. Let it cool down. Come back to it. Embracing is very, very strong because it actually gets right into the grain of the steel. Okay. Basically, there you go. See that? This raising lap is as easy as that. But like I said, get yourself some better tips and it'll work better for you. Okay. Okay. Sure. Any questions so far on this? No. Keith, got any questions? It's a bit over my head. <laughs> Does it matter how you shut the torch down, which fuel you turn off first to fuel the oxygen? Some people say turn the acetylene off, then the oxygen will blow it out. Some people say turn the oxygen off, then turn the acetylene. It depends what book. So it doesn't matter. Just turn both off and you always look, make sure that it's out. You know, and when you're done, always turn your tanks and everything off. Okay. And basically, that's that's about it. It's pretty... Now it's just like riding a bicycle. You learn the basics. You know, you know the safety of everything here. Mm -hmm. How it works. Now you just got to practice. You just remember you got 5 and 30 for cotton, 5 and 5 for welding, and you just practice with your tip size. Like I said, you need one tip a little bit bigger than this and that would flow right out. I mean, that isn't bad, but okay. I've done it a couple times, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. And you can have this brazen rod okay. and I got you some steel there. And like I say, if you want to take a piece of sandpaper and sand it or whatever, and, and you'll get the feel of it. Okay. You know, you can put a piece up, do a T-well, do an edge joint, mm -hmm. whatever. But you'll find out um, brazen's um, cast iron. Let's talk a little bit about brazing cast iron. How I do cast iron is I'll turn it, the torch on like so. See how that stood is right there? Uh -huh. And I'll take a piece of cast iron. You got a stop drill if it's got a crack in it. Like let's say you got a pump hose that throws and busts it. Mm -hmm. Find where each end is and stop drill. Okay. Then you're going to want to V it out real good. 
Okay. Then what I do is I just turn the acetylene lamp on like so, and you do this. See how that black? Uh huh. See how that turned black? Yeah. Now turn the oxygen on like so, and heat it up. And see the black going away? Uh huh. See when the black's burned off like that? Now this piece has already been warm because I braised on it, but see how it's burning that black off there? Uh huh. As soon as the black's gone, then it's about 500 degrees. Hmm. And it's time to start braising. Okay. Okay, that's sort of the farmer's way of doing it. Hmm. I mean, they make temple sticks and that, but that's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then when you braise it, when you braise cast iron, you're going to find out a lot of times you put that first pass on, it's called tinny. You just want to get it so it flows on the whole thing. And once in a while, you get a spot where it won't adhere. Just take a grinder, grind it again, and then do it a couple times. Hmm. Don't get that cast iron red hot. Do not. So when you start to tin it and that, if it looks like it's starting to get hot, get away from it, let it cool down a little bit. Don't ever quench it. Then go back and braise it right on up. And when you get done, cover it up with something so it doesn't cool off real fast, hmm. and you should be all set. So that's, you know, for brazen cast iron. And stuff. And cast iron will crack if it... Uh, well, cool cast up. iron is, there's no ductility to it, you know, that's so high in carbon. Yeah. You know, and that's why you got to stop drill the cracks, and that's why it busted anyway. Maybe somebody left, you know, we do a lot of water pump housings and stuff like that, um, because... People let water in there in the wintertime and it froze and busted the pump or the housing, but uh -huh. it does not work real good for exhaust manifolds. The reason being, exhaust manifolds, if you look under a car, certain cars, they're red hot. Uh -huh. And this bronze melts at 12, 1400 mm -hmm. degrees, mm -hmm. so that's not going to hold up. People always say, just weld up, uh, brings up the manifolds on a car. Really, you should stick weld them with nickel or something like that. Hmm. But on other things, if it ain't heated, gas pumps or other cast iron things that are broken, brazing works real well. How do I know if I want to braze it or weld it? It depends what the application is. Okay. What's it for? If you got a pump hose in or something, braze it. There's no, you know, it doesn't have to endure strength. If there is, cast iron is tricky. Some stuff you, you just can't even fix it, and it depends on the cast iron. Let's say you got a piece of cast iron out of a wood stove, a grate, somebody says weld it, throw it away. Because the carbon and everything's burned out of it, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to even weld it. They're going to do nothing. It's like a rusty car fender. You go to try to weld it, there's nothing left there. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got to have some steel and carbon, you know, in the part or it's not going to work. Okay. Okay, that's a rule of thumb right there. Mm -hmm. But for... A lot of things, brazing works excellent. You know, let's say you're in here and you want to weld a tab on this to do something on a car or whatever. Mm -hmm. Brazing works excellent for all that kind of stuff. Instead of stick welding it okay. or whatever. And like I said, the more you get around it, the more you play with it, you'll find out what applications work best for what. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure on something, your dad's got my phone number, you can call me and I'll help you walk you through it. Sure. So, but the, like I said, the first thing is get some torches. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, you got the basics now. Mm -hmm. Like I said, and then practice, I'll leave that stuff there. You do bring it up to kindling temperature, get straight, and when you cut, keep the torch so it's just off the top, and just follow it along nice and steady. That's all there is to it. And it has to be steel. You can't cut stainless steel, you can't cut aluminum, you can't cut cast iron. Mm, okay. Okay. And even the cutting tip, let's say you get it dirty, take a block of wood and scrub it on there, mm -hmm. a lot of times it'll clean. Mm. Instead of grabbing the tip cleaners right away. Mm -hmm. I think I threw you another set of tip cleaners in here too. Yeah, I did. I didn't know if you had a set. There's some steel you can practice on that. Okay. Next course action, you want to go to welding on with stick welding? Mm-hmm. Want me to explain that to you? Sure. Any questions on this, Keith? I'm all set. 
you feel comfortable with yeah, what yeah. we do, uh -huh. what we said, and you can, like I said, now you can review it. Now you sort of understand the principles when they're telling you about pressures, acetone. It's it's really pretty simple. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is so you can light this thing without blowing the roof off. Right. <laughs> Okay, see how this says 50 to 295? Uh -huh. There's a duty cycle on a welder, and these are called a buzz box. Okay. Okay. And they're just a little AC welder. So at 295 amps, you can only weld two out of every 10 minutes hmm. with this machine. They don't tell you that when you buy them. Okay. Like the industrial machines, the big ones, like in the welding shop, mm -hmm. them have a 60% duty cycle. Mm. So at wide open, I can run six out of every 10 minutes, but you're switching electrodes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay? But this, a 30 amp should run fine. Okay. Usually they have something on here. Yeah, see, here's the duty cycle. See them? Oh, yeah. See, 60. See right there? See, it's telling you all the different duty cycles. Yep, all the way down to 20. Yep. And you get to right here, it's going to be at 10. Okay. Okay. But I'm sure 30 will work on here because you're not going to run wide open. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about the welder here in a minute. Let's talk about an electrode. Mm -hmm. Every electrode has a numbering system on it. Okay. okay. <coughs> this one here is 6011. Okay. The 60 means 60,000 tensile strength, okay? Most mild steel is 45, 50,000 tensile strength. That means 60. <coughs> Excuse me. The 1 means it can be welded in all positions. If it's a 2, like a 7024, that means it can only be welded in flat and horizontal. Hmm. And the last number, the one tells you what type of a coating this is. This is a cellulose type coating, which is almost, it almost smells like burnt wood when you make it. Hmm. Okay, if you look up, there's fast freeze electrodes, fast flow electrodes. This is called a fast freeze electrode. It welds real good out of position and it's deep digging. I use this electrode almost for everything because I can weld over paint with it, I can weld over rust with it, whatever. Hmm. But if you're a novice and you're start, first starting out, you might want to go to a, like a 6013. That's real easy to start and whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay? Electrodes have different diameter. This is an eighth inch diameter. They have all different sizes. This here on an eighth inch electrode, you're going to run it around, oh, 90 amps. Okay? Mm -hmm. And anytime you weld, how you start an arc is you always scratch it a little bit like this. Okay. And with these, they don't have the arc voltage that a regular industrial machine until you get the feel of it. But uh, once you get the feel, it'll start, and then you know you just right follow it right along. Hmm. We're not hooked up, so I can't weld with you today. Mm -hmm. But uh, you want to want to use a number ten lens, and you want to get get a that. There, you don't want that. Okay. You, want a, you want a good helmet. Put this helmet on once. That helmet there is 35 years old. Let's see how nice you can see out of that. Now look and feel how it fits on your head good. Mm -hmm. No, that one there, that's... You can't, you won't even be able to see out of that. It's like I used to tell the student, <coughs> if you can't see, how are you going to weld? Sure. You know, you got to be able to see good. Okay. So there's a lot of different and nice helmets. I do not recommend, and everybody will try to sell you one, one of them with the batteries in it. So when you start to weld, it goes dark. Oh, uh -huh. The batteries are always going dead in them and whatever. Okay? You'll get used to this. You'll learn to put it up here. You'll learn to do that, and it'll come down, and you'll learn. You'll get the feel of it. Okay? Okay, what electrodes are we got here? See, here's a 116th. 6013. Okay. See right here, and that see the amperage is way down. This is, this would be welded almost paper thin stuff. Okay. This eighth inch electro that I just brings down here mm -hmm. would work fine for that. Okay. Okay. But like I said, the electro you want to get is something. I don't know what's in that one. Let's see what numbers in there. 
6011. See there, see that? See, yeah, somebody already had 6011. Okay. Okay. This machine is just AC. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's alternating current. Mm -hmm. So it's going from positive to negative, what, 60 times a second. Uh -huh. Okay, now if you get a DC machine, you have DC positive and DC negative. Okay, when you will with like a 6011 or whatever, you would set it on DC reverse, which is DC positive. You get a lot more penetration and stuff. Hmm. And if you run it on DC straight, you get less penetration. But on AC, it's right in the middle. Now hmm. for the average home person working around here and that, mm -hmm. this is nothing wrong with this machine. Okay. Okay. It just takes practice to learn to run it. It's like anything else. It just takes a little bit of practice, a little finesse. And I got a 6011, I use a little bit of motion. With the 6013, you can drag it right in there. Hmm. But don't go over an eighth inch electrode with this machine. Okay. You know, they don't go to a 532nd. That really lugging it down. Hmm. But, <clears throat> yeah, you'll be able to... For some reason, you only got two wires here. I don't know if they were using this for the ground, but you should have two hots and a neutral here. Okay. I don't know if one fell in there. I don't know what you got. It's just like right here, you know, on your dryer plug. See, mm -hmm. you got two hots and a, and a neutral. Uh huh. But 30 amps. If you got 30 amps out here, it'll run this. Okay. Good. No problem at all. That, that'll run 30 amps all day long. Yeah, here you go, 6013, 8 inch. Uh -huh. Let's say you're welding angle iron together and stuff. Mm -hmm. Really good. Guess you can just almost stick it on there and go really easy. No spatter hardly, the slag. Now let's say you welded something and you ever see when you chip the slag off, there's like a hole okay. where it didn't fuse. But it's running too cold, turn the heat up. Hmm. It didn't get hot enough to fuse the two pieces together, and that's why you're getting the holes and stuff in there. Okay. But 6013, that's a good electrode. What I do is I buy these canisters right here. Uh -huh. And at home, I got a, an asbestos big box I bought with a light bulb in it that I keep all my rods in to keep them dry. Oh, okay. But if you don't, you can use these containers right there. See what's happening. Them rods are going to get all rusty in the flux. gets all wet. Hmm. And anytime the... Flux and that's getting wet. You're putting hydrogen into the weld, and that's one thing you don't want is water trapped in your weld because it causes cracking or whatever. Uh -huh. okay. So that's why you want to keep your electrodes dry. Hmm. You know, put them in a safe spot. Even some people get the little teeny refrigerators that are, don't work. Uh -huh. They fit perfect. The electrodes fit in them. You put a light bulb in there, a little 60 hmm. watt, and they're dry all the time. Okay, makes sense. I wish I was hooked up. I'd we'd run a bead, but it's it's relatively pretty simple. Okay. You know. See, so you got a high range and a low range, and you get that's right here, okay. where you plug in your electrode. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can plug it in the high or the low. See, so you know, right here is the different scales. Uh huh. There's a slide mechanism in there. It's pretty simple. Okay. But there's nothing wrong with that. Good. That's a nice little welder, a little craftsman. Yeah, just hook it up. Like I said, that, that'll work fine. Okay. It ain't going to draw more than 30 amps. If it does, all I'm going to do is strip the breaker. Mm -hmm. Sure. But doing what you're doing, you're probably only drawing, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 amps off it. Okay. Good. But yeah, I would hook that up and then just practice with it. Get a good helmet. Okay. Huntsman and them, they're light. They're almost like a cardboard type. Mm -hmm. And I like the big shield mass versus the little one mm -hmm. because if it's not perfect or if you're welding, you can see more. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That makes sense. So if it's not perfectly down or you're, you have to put your head under something or you're welding a piece of equipment, you can see mm -hmm. a little better. Okay. Good. Any questions on that? No, I don't think so.
There. Welding, welding lesson in a hat, shoe, or whatever. <laughs> but now you understand if you look in the manuals and stuff, what the number system does. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a little bit about electrode storage. Mm -hmm. You know, now you know the basics on your torches. You know how to light the torches, how to set them, mm -hmm. how to set the oxygen. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty easy actually. Now it's just take practice. Yeah. Just sit there and cut and learn how to cut. See, ever cut that? That isn't bad. Okay. See, the, that's called the dross. When you cut it like that, the line should be straight up and down. Hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, cutting torch tips come in the same size as like uh, your other tips. Zero being the smallest, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. You're going to want from everything around here, a zero to a one. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tip. That piece of steel, I think, came from Jack, and he's a welder. Okay. Yeah. That's what I ring. said. You can see. See, you shouldn't. You shouldn't get a lot of this on there. But mm -hmm. if you do, you just take a hammer and hit it like that, and usually it pops right off. Hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah. See, that isn't. See, that's. I mean, besides the wiggle part to it, mm -hmm. you know, see how his lines are nice and straight? Uh-huh. Yeah, every cut that did a pretty nice job. Okay. That's basically how it should look. Mm -hmm. Edge is not burnt way over. And you'll know the speed as soon as you start cutting. If you keep losing your line, you're going too fast. Mm -hmm. If it's getting a lot of melt over, you're going too slow. Uh-huh. Okay? Sure. And, and it's pretty self-explanatory once you do, you know. Mm -hmm. Any other questions you got for me? The guy that gave us all this equipment, he said this regulator, he had trouble with it, but he said you could send it out and get it rebuilt. Is it worth getting these rebuilt? Hang it on the wall. Okay. No. Not something like that. Okay. Like I said, you got good gauges there, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's cheaper to buy the whole box mm -hmm. with the torch tips in it, the gauges, the holes, everything. Mm -hmm. And then you always got a spare. Okay. You know, you're a young guy yet, so you'll be using this stuff forever. Right. And once in a while, you're going to use it or something, and something might go bad in it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or an accident does happen, a chain comes undone and one falls and breaks the regular, you have a spare set. So shop around. I think it might be just as cheap instead of just buying the torches and the mixer that, that comes with the regulator and the holes. Okay. And this is nothing wrong with this holes, and they even buy a slice kit. It looks just like this piece here, see it, it's right uh -huh. on both sides. Uh -huh. So you can put the hoses together if you want longer hoses. Okay. So if you want to be out farther, you know. See on my torch set, I got one set's got like a hundred foot holes on there. Because mm -hmm. let's say I'm way up on the river bank and I gotta cut something, I don't want to pull my torches all the way down there, and I used to have them on my truck. Mm -hmm. I could go any place, but the only thing is Every time you turn them on, you got to fill this hole with gas, so you use more gas. Uh -huh. Junkyards use long holes. Oh yeah, junkyard and all junkyards. You'll see them guys have cutting torches this long; they don't yeah. have to bend over. Yeah. But they, they would, and you'll see some junkyards. I've been to them. They'll braise a nut on the back or a bolt here so they can beat stuff off. No, <laughs> don't ever hit anything with your torch. <laughs> sure. Brad, what about uh, refilling tanks, the process, procedure? You, you have to bring them in and they'll exchange them. Who, who is they? Is so, that whatever who your welding supply outfit is here. And hopefully, them are Lindy tanks, hopefully he's a Lindy dealer. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And what these are, have are statically tested, so that's why they you exchange them. Hmm. Okay. <coughs> now, are you ready to take these in into it for exchange? Of course, I'll turn them off, unhook the gauge, I'll put, put a cap, cap on. I yep. got a cap for it. Yep. Any special precautions when I transport it? No, what I did in mine, on my pickup, I took a... a 2 by 8 about so long, then I took another piece, and then I cut. So mm -hmm. the tank sits right in there, and then I got two bungees. Okay. That I put on so they don't roll around on my truck, because they're otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, so it's... A board so long with you know two of them because a lot of times I'm hauling two, but if you just one, mm -hmm. just take a saw and cut it. And okay, that's the easiest way to strap them down that I found. Sure, make a cradle for them. <coughs> yep. Right in place. Yep. Okay. 
Always make sure they're chained up. Okay. Before you ever move them, don't ever move the cylinders without a cap. Okay. Okay. Yeah, now when you get the new acetylene, it might come with a cap and it'll be a little different. Okay. And you might have to use this adapter. Okay. Or the right one, you might have to get a scoop, a female adapter that'll fit to there, that'll screw to the tank. So make sure. Now, if you buy a new set of torches, and would come with uh, gauges, mm -hmm. might have the different end on it or come with the adapter. Hmm. They make that because they're switching them. Why they're doing that, I don't know. Okay. But now that the acetylene cylinder is almost like an oxygen cylinder. Hmm. You know, with the, then they have this on top. They don't have the T-handle anymore. Huh. Okay. Good. Yeah. There you can see. See that white? That's just the slag on there. That oh yes. Yeah. Let's say. Uh huh. That's the whole idea. You just want to get some ripples in there. And <laughs> When you first start welding, though, you'll, you'll get the feel of it. Okay. You might want to get a better, even a set of goggles is better than that. Okay. You know, and the Victor set will come with a set of goggles. Hmm. You know. Roughly how long could I weld with a set of tanks this size that were full? Okay. Welding, a lot longer than cutting. Okay. When you start cutting, you're going to start using a lot more oxygen. Mm -hmm. And that's what burns up a tank of oxygen. Okay. You'll probably, if you were cutting, let's say today, doing a lot of cutting, you'd probably use two oxygens to every set of leaf. Mm -hmm. Now gas welding, one and one, because you let use them less pressure. Mm -hmm. But you can hear when you're shh, shh, especially them are small tanks. Uh -huh. But for here, farm use or home use, fine. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And you'll find out, you'll come out here and you go to do something, you go, damn. <laughs> get halfway through, it's empty, you gotta run and get a tank. So, mm -hmm. but that's... I, know, I know at work, we rent all of our tanks. What's the advantage for a group like our school for renting versus buying? Usually they lease, they pay a lease on them. Uh -huh. And nobody owns a tank anymore. That's why I always... I, I hope you don't have a hard time exchanging them because okay. I don't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. You got them from somebody else. That's why I used to tell my students, if you see a set of tanks in a garage sale, somebody says, I own them, you don't own them. So many times people will get them and they'll go to the thing and they go to exchange them. They go, these aren't your tanks. The serial number is right here, da 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 da. These belong to Joe Blow. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they'll take them. Now, if you want a set of tanks, they might say, okay, we can lease you a set lifetime lease, but it's going to be 350 bucks. Hmm. So I don't know what's going to happen here. See, I pay a monthly fee for my tanks. Okay. Hmm. So hopefully when you bring them to the welding place, it depends who's there, you'll just exchange them for you. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't look it up, but hmm. sometimes they do. And they're getting less and less strict about that. I, they used to be really strict, but it seems like they're less and less though. Because they know them size tanks are the home tanks. See, I got the big ones, the uh -huh. industrial ones like you got at school. Uh -huh. Well, if somebody like you bring that in, they go, uh oh, no, where'd you get that? That came from a company. Okay. You know, hmm. like KB Welding or the school bus garage, and no certain size tanks. Mm -hmm. Who owns what? And that's why I think they've become more lenient with these sizes. Okay. Then would be, I'm going to guess, air gas. Okay. Because you might be able to take them to school. Mm. If it's empty, okay. you talk to the truck driver and he'll exchange it for you. Okay. Then you just pay him. But I would ask him next time. I would take a picture of them on your phone uh -huh. and then show them to him. Say, how do I exchange these? Okay. And he'll tell you. Because he'll know right away. See, them are Lindy tanks. See, Lindy tanks, the old ones, it looks like a window on them. Okay. They used to have a German swastika oh. because Lindy, Lindy was German. Oh. In the Second World War, <laughs> that, so they stamped over it. If you get an old tank, you'll see it looks like a a window because oh. they stamped over the swastika. Okay. You know. Wow. And then building the Mackinac Bridge was a big shortage of tanks. Because hmm. say, hey, Joe, bring that empty back and then get a full. What did Joe do? <laughs> Off the side of the bridge with the wow. tank and said, "I'm not hauling that empty." Yeah. Huh. 
so. But yeah, they're hydrostatically tested. There's a test date and everything on these. And it'll be the date that it's manufactured. See, there's all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when they do is they put them into a, a, well, it's like a big machine, and they pump water to them like three times what the pressure is normally on that tank. Mm -hmm. And if you ever arc mark, let's say you're sitting here and you're welding, and your electrode stinger fell off and for some reason put the arc mark on that, make sure you tell the manufacturer, because that'll put a hard spot on that tank. Hmm. And if that tank you know, is going to expand and contract in the heat or whatever, that could crack or explode. Huh. Okay. Okay. And they won't say, just say, hey, there's an arc mark on this tank. No. Okay, thanks for telling us. I'll still exchange it for you. Mm -hmm. But that way somebody else doesn't get hurt. Sure. Hmm. Any other question? The relief probably on that acetylene, if you look on the bottom, underneath it, it's recessed up. Uh -huh. That's probably where the relief is on that. Okay. And if it does, if, if for some reason that ever did pop, just make sure you get it outside right away. Mm -hmm. Out of all my years, I've only had two tanks ever the relief popped on when they were in the school in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the students were on a cart, they ran it right outside right away. Mm -hmm. Just to let it bleed off where it's... Why, why would that happen? Faulty valve in it or whatever, I don't okay. know. But only twice and it's in my, you know, all the years I've been around it. Mm -hmm. And one wasn't even in my class, it was in another class that the guy told me about it. Mm -hmm. But just get it outside, don't let it blow off in here. Yeah. Okay. And just remember, that's why the gauge is 15. Acetylene is very unstable after 15. Mm -hmm. so Got it. What you want to do now is turn these in, keep the cylinder off, and then when you open the valve, this will go down, and then that will go down. Okay. Okay, so you always want to relieve the pressure here too. So, so you turn that valve on, uh -huh. you're settling. Yep. Okay, I got to make sure that tank's off. Where's the red tank? So, go ahead, make sure it's off. Yeah, see, there it just went to zero. See? Same with okay. the oxygen, turn your oxygen on, this is off. Mm -hmm. See? See how about that one? That's always going to go down because that's your tank pressure, and then this will go down and last. And then relieve it just so they just free. And that takes the pressure off the diaphragm. You'll see a lot of people leave them on and turn them on and off all the time. Mm -hmm. That's not good because it, there's pressure on that diaphragm, and it's jarring in diaphragm all the time. Sure. Other than that, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Good. I really appreciate it. No problem.